Welcome to the People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. This is one of our exciting reading episodes. We will have a regular episode again next week. PGTTCM is part of the Dark Myths Collective. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, or any place you catch your podcasts. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and Twitter too. PGTTCM is brought to you by bunnyslippers.com and founditemclothing.com. Look to them for some really cool stuff. Want to help out PGTTCM? Why not donate a buck or five to PGTTCM at, uh, you could also donate some money to paypal.me slash PGTTCM. Or you could always become part of our t-shirt club, sticker club on patreon.com slash PGTTCM. And also, you can go to pgttcm.threadless.com to buy one of our shirts, stickers, whatnot, and yeah, thank you so much for your support. Today's reading is part B, Bird West Reanimator, a public domain recording from LibriVox, and just a reminder, it was written by H.P. Lovecraft, and first published in Homebrew Magazine February through July 1922, and then uh, seen by the main public in March 1942 in a uh, issue of Weird Tales. So yeah, that's that's the uh, print history of Herbert West Reanimator. But yeah, it was written somewhere between 1921 and June 1922, and uh, is uh, Lovecraft's attempt at uh, humor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Bonehoff. Herbert West, Reanimator, by H.P. Lovecraft. Part B. Part 4. The Scream of the Dead. The scream of a dead man gave to me that acute and added horror of Dr. Herbert West, which harassed the later years of our companionship. It is natural that such a thing as a dead man's scream should give horror, for it is obviously not a pleasing or ordinary occurrence. But I was used to similar experiences, hence suffered on this occasion only because of a particular circumstance. And, as I have implied, it was not of the dead man himself that I became afraid. Herbert West, whose associate and assistant I was, possessed scientific interests far beyond the usual routine of a village physician. That was why, when establishing his practice in Bolton, he had chosen an isolated house near the potter's field. Briefly and brutally stated, West's sole absorbing interest was the secret study of the phenomena of life and its cessation leading toward the reanimation of the dead through injections of an excitant solution. For this ghastly experimenting, it was necessary to have a constant supply of very fresh human bodies. Very fresh because the least decay hopelessly damaged the brain structure, and human because we found that the solution had to be compounded differently for different types of organisms. Scores of rabbits and guinea pigs had been killed and treated, but their trail was a blind one. West had never fully succeeded because he had never been able to secure a corpse sufficiently fresh. What he wanted were bodies from which vitality had only just departed, bodies with every cell intact and capable of receiving again the impulse toward the mode of motion called life. There was hope that this second and artificial life might be made perpetual by repetitions of the injection, but we had learned that an ordinary natural life would not respond to the action. To establish the artificial motion, natural life must be extinct. The specimens must be very fresh, but genuinely dead. The awesome quest had begun when West and I were students at the Miskatonic University Medical School in Arkham vividly conscious for the first time of the thoroughly mechanical nature of life. That was seven years before, but West looked scarcely a day older now. He was small, blonde, 
clean-shaven, soft-voiced, and spectacled, with only an occasional flash of a cold blue eye to tell of the hardening and growing fanaticism of his character under the pressure of his terrible investigations. Our experiences had often been hideous in the extreme, the results of defective reanimation when lumps of graveyard clay had been galvanized into morbid, unnatural, and brainless motion by various modifications of the vital solution. One thing had uttered a nerve-shattering scream, another had risen violently, beaten us both to unconsciousness, and run amuck in a shocking way before it could be placed behind asylum bars. Still another, a loathsome African monstrosity, had clawed out of its shallow grave and done a deed. West had had to shoot that object. We could not get bodies fresh enough to show any trace of reason when reanimated, so had perforce created nameless horrors. It was disturbing to think that one, perhaps two of our monsters, still lived. That thought haunted us shadowingly, till finally West disappeared under frightful circumstances, but at the time of the scream in the cellar laboratory of the isolated Bolton College, our fears were subordinate to our anxiety for extremely fresh specimens. West was more avid than I, so that it almost seemed to me that he looked half covetously at any very healthy living physique. It was in July 1910 that the bad luck regarding specimens began to turn. I had been on a long visit to my parents in Illinois, and, upon my return, found West in a state of singular elation. He had, he told me excitedly, in all likelihood solved the problem of freshness through an approach from an entirely new angle, that of artificial preservation. I had known that he was working on a new and highly unusual embalming compound, and was not surprised that it had turned out well but until he explained the details, I was rather puzzled as to how such a compound would help in our work, since the objectionable staleness of the specimens was largely due to delay occurring before we secured them. This, I now saw, West had clearly recognized, creating his embalming compound for future rather than immediate use, and trusting to fate to supply again some very recent and unburied corpse, as it had years before when we obtained the Negro killed in the Bolton Prize fight. At last, fate had been kind, so that on this occasion there lay in the secret cellar laboratory a corpse whose delay could not by any possibility have begun. What would happen on reanimation, and whether we could help for a revival of mind and reason, West did not venture to predict. The experiment would be a landmark in our studies, and he had saved the new body for my return, so that both might share in the spectacle in accustomed to fashion. West told me how he had obtained the specimen. It had been a vigorous man, a well-dressed stranger, just off the train, on his way to transact some business with the Bolton Worsted Mills. The walk through the town had been long, and by the time the stranger paused at our cottage to ask the way to the factories, his heart had become greatly overtaxed. He had refused a stimulant, and had suddenly dropped dead only a moment later. The body, as might be expected, seemed to West a heaven-sent gift. In his brief conversation, the stranger had made it clear that he was unknown in Bolton, and a search of his pockets subsequently revealed him to be one Robert Levitt of St. Louis, apparently without a family to make instant inquiries about his disappearance. If this man could not be restored to life, no one would know of our experiment. We buried our materials in a dense strip of woods between the house and the potter's field. If, on the other hand, he could be restored, our fame would be brilliantly and perpetually established. So, without delay, West had injected into the body's wrist the compound which would hold it fresh for until after my arrival. The matter of the presumably weak heart, which, to my mind, imperiled the success of our experiment, did not appear to trouble West extensively. He hoped, at least, to obtain what he had never obtained before, a rekindled spark of reason, and perhaps a normal living creature. So on the night of July 18, 1910, 
Herbert West and I stood in the cellar laboratory and gazed at a white, silent figure beneath the dazzling arc light. The embalming compound had worked uncannily well, for as I stared fascinatedly at the sturdy frame which had lain two weeks without stiffening, I was moved to seek West's assurance that the thing was really dead. This assurance he gave readily enough, reminding me that the reanimating solution was never used without careful tests as to life, since it could have no effect if any of the original vitality were present. As West proceeded to take preliminary steps, I was impressed by the vast intricacy of the new experiment, an intricacy so vast that he could trust no hand less delicate than his own. Forbidding me to touch the body, he first injected a drug in the wrist, just beside the place his needle had punctured when injecting the embalming compound. This, he said, was to neutralize the compound and release the system to a normal relaxation so that the reanimating solution might freely work when injected. Slightly later, when a change in a gentle tremor seemed to affect the dead limbs, West stuffed a pillow-like object violently over the twitching face, not withdrawing it until the corpse appeared quiet and ready for our attempt at reanimation. The pale enthusiast now applied some last prefunctory tests for absolute lifelessness, withdrew satisfied, and finally injected into the left arm an accurately measured amount of the vital elixir prepared during the afternoon with a greater care than we had used since college days when our feet were new and groping. I cannot express the wild, breathless suspense with which we waited for results on this first really fresh specimen, the first we could reasonably expect to open its lips in rational speech, perhaps to tell of what it had seen beyond the unfathomable abyss. West was a materialist believing in no soul and attributing all the working of consciousness to bodily phenomena. Consequently, he looked for no revelation of hideous secrets from the gulfs and caverns beyond death's barrier. I did not wholly disagree with him, theoretically, yet held vague instinctive remnants of the primitive faith of my forefathers, so that I could not help eyeing the corpse with a certain amount of awe and terrible expectation. Besides, I could not extract from my memory that hideous, inhuman shriek we heard on the night we tried our first experiment in the deserted farmhouse at Arkham. Very little time had elapsed before I saw the attempt was not to be a total failure. A touch of color came to cheeks hitherto chalk white and spread out under the curiously ample stubble of sandy beard. West, who had his hand on the pulse of the left wrist, suddenly nodded significantly, and almost simultaneously a mist appeared on the mirror inclined above the body's mouth. There followed a few spasmodic muscular motions, and then an audible breathing and visible motion of the chest. I looked at the closed eyelids and thought I detected a quivering. Then the lids opened, showing eyes which were gray, calm, and alive, but still unintelligent and not even curious. In a moment of fantastic whim, I whispered questions to the reddening ears, questions of other worlds of which the memory might still be present. Subsequent terror drove them from my mind, but I think the last one which I repeated was, where have you been? I do not yet know whether I was answered or not, for no sound came from the well-shaped mouth. But I do know that at that moment I firmly thought the thin lips moved silently, forming syllables which I would have vocalized as only now, if that phrase had possessed any sense or relevancy. At that moment, as I say, I was elated with the conviction that the one great goal had been attained, and that for the first time a reanimated corpse had uttered distinct words impelled by actual reason. In the next moment, there was no doubt about the triumph, no doubt that the solution had truly accomplished, at least temporarily, its full mission of restoring rational and articulate life to the dead. But in that triumph, there came to me the greatest of all horrors, not horror of the thing that spoke, but of the deed that I had witnessed, and of the man with whom my professional fortunes were joined. 
for that very fresh body, at last writhing into full and terrifying consciousness with eyes dilated at the memory of its last seen on earth, threw out its frantic hands in a life and death struggle with the air, and suddenly collapsing into a second and final dissolution from which there could be no return, screamed out the cry that will ring eternally in my aching brain. Help! Keep off, you cursed little towhead fiend! Keep that damned needle away from me! Part 5. The Horror from the Shadows Many men have related hideous things, not mentioned in print, which happened on the battlefields of the Great War. Some of these things have made me faint, Others have convulsed me with devastating nausea, while still others have made me tremble and look behind me in the dark. Yet despite the worst of them, I believe that I can myself relate the most hideous thing of all, the shocking, the unnatural, the unbelievable horror from the shadows. In 1915, I was a physician with the rank of first lieutenant in a Canadian regiment in Flanders, one of many Americans to precede the government itself into the gigantic struggle. I had not entered the army of my own initiative, but rather as a natural result of the enlistment of the man whose indispensable assistant I was, the celebrated Boston surgical specialist, Dr. Herbert West. Dr. West had been avid for a chance to serve as a surgeon in a great war, and when the chance had come, he carried me with him almost against my will. There were reasons why I could have been glad to let the war separate us, reasons why I found the practice of medicine and the companionship of West more and more irritating. But when he had gone to Ottawa and through a colleague's influence secured a medical commission as major, I could not resist the imperious persuasion of one determined that I should accompany him in my usual capacity. When I say that Dr. West was avid to serve in battle, I do not mean to imply that he was either naturally warlike were anxious for the safety of civilization, always an ice-cold intellectual machine, slight, blonde, blue-eyed and spectacled, I think he secretly sneered at my occasional martial enthusiasms and censures of supine neutrality. There was, however, something he wanted in embattled Flanders, and in order to secure it, had had to assume a military exterior. What he wanted was not a thing which many persons want, but something connected with the peculiar branch of medical science which he had chosen quite clandestinely to follow, and in which he had achieved amazing and occasionally hideous results. It was, in fact, nothing more or less than an abundant supply of freshly killed men in every stage of dismemberment. Herbert West needed fresh bodies because his life work was the reanimation of the dead. This work was not known to the fashionable clientele who had so swiftly built up his fame after his arrival in Boston, but was only too well known to me, who had been his closest friend and sole assistant since the old days at Miskatonic University Medical School at Arkham. It was in those college days that he had begun his terrible experiments, first on small animals and then on human bodies shockingly obtained. There was a solution which he injected into the veins of dead things, and if they were fresh enough, they responded in strange ways. He had had much trouble in discovering the proper formula, for each type of organism was found to need a stimulus especially adapted to it. Terror stalked him when he reflected on his partial failures, nameless things resulting from imperfect solutions or from bodies insufficiently fresh. A certain number of these failures had remained alive. One was at an asylum, while others had vanished. And as he thought of conceivable, yet virtually impossible eventualities, he often shivered beneath his usual solidity. West had soon learned that absolute freshness was the prime requisite for useful specimens, and had accordingly resorted to frightful and unnatural expedients in body snatching. In college, and during our early practice together in the factory town of Bolton, my attitude toward him had been largely one of fascinated admiration. But as his boldness and methods grew, I began to develop a gnawing fear. I did not like the way he looked at healthy living bodies. And then, there came a nightmarish session in the cellar laboratory, 
when I learned that a certain specimen had been a living body when he secured it. That was the first time he had ever been able to revive the quality of rational thought in a corpse, and his success, obtained at such a loathsome cost, had completely hardened him. Of his methods in the intervening five years I dare not speak. I was held to him by sheer force of fear, and witnessed sights that no human tongue could repeat. Gradually I came to find Herbert West himself more horrible than anything he did. That was when it dawned on me that his once normal scientific zeal for prolonged life had subtly degenerated into a mere morbid and ghoulish curiosity and secret sense of charnel picturesqueness. His interest became a hellish and perverse addiction to the repellently and fiendishly abnormal. He gloated calmly over artificial monstrosities which would make most healthy men drop dead from fright and disgust. He became, behind his pallid intellectuality, a fastidious Baudelaire of physical experiment, a languid elegabalus of the tombs. Dangers he met unflinchingly, crimes he committed unmoved. I think the climax came when he had proved his point that rational life can be restored and had sought new worlds to conquer by experimenting on the reanimation of detached parts of bodies. He had wild and original ideas on the independent vital properties of organic cells and nerve tissue separated from the natural physiological system, and achieved some hideous preliminary results in the form of never-dying, artificially nourished tissue obtained from the nearly hatched eggs of an indescribable tropical reptile. Two biological points he was exceedingly anxious to settle. First, whether any amount of consciousness and rational action be possible without the brain, proceeding from the spinal cord and various nerve centers. And second, whether any kind of ethereal, intangible relation distinct from the material cells may exist to link the surgically separated parts of what had previously been a single living organism. All this research work required a prodigious supply of freshly slaughtered human flesh. And that was why Herbert West had entered the Great War. The phantasmal, unmentionable thing occurred one midnight late in March 1915 in a field hospital behind the lines of St. Eloy. I wonder even now if it could have been other than a demonic dream of delirium. West had a private laboratory in an east room of the barn-like temporary edifice, assigned him on his plea that he was devising new and radical methods for the treatment of hitherto hopeless cases of maiming. There, he worked like a butcher in the midst of his gory wares. I could never get used to the levity with which he handled and classified certain things. At times, he actually did perform marvels of surgery for the soldiers, but his chief delights were of a less public and philanthropic kind, requiring many explanations of sounds which seemed peculiar even amidst that babble of the damned. Among these sounds were frequent revolver shots, surely not uncommon on a battlefield, but distinctly uncommon in a hospital. Dr. West's reanimated specimens were not meant for long existence or a large audience. Besides human tissue, West employed much of the reptile embryo tissue which he had cultivated in such singular results. It was better than human material for maintaining life in organless fragments, and that was now my friend's chief activity. In a dark corner of the laboratory, over a queer incubating burner, he kept a large covered vat full of this reptilian cell matter, which multiplied and grew puffily and hideously. On the night of which I speak, we had a splendid new specimen, a man at once physically powerful and of such high mentality that a sensitive nervous system was assured. It was rather ironic, for he was the officer who had helped West to his commission, and who was now to have been our associate. Moreover, he had in the past secretly studied the theory of reanimation to some extent under West. Major Sir Eric Moreland Clapham Lee, DSO, was the greatest surgeon in our division and had been hastily assigned to the St. Eloy sector when news of the heavy fighting reached headquarters. He had come in an airplane piloted by the intrepid Lieutenant Ronald Hill, 
only to be shot down when directly over his destination. The fall had been spectacular and awful. Hill was unrecognizable afterwards, but the wreck yielded up the great surgeon in a nearly decapitated but otherwise intact condition. West had greedily seized the lifeless thing which had once been his friend and fellow scholar, and I shuddered when he finished severing the head, placed it in his hellish vat of pulpy reptile tissue to preserve it for future experiments, and proceeded to treat the decapitated body on the operating table. He injected new blood, joined certain veins, arteries, and nerves at the headless neck, and closed the ghastly aperture with engraft skin from an unidentified specimen which had borne an officer's uniform. I knew what he wanted, to see if this highly organized body could exhibit without its head any of the signs of mental life which had distinguished Sir Eric Moreland Clapham Lee. Once a student of reanimation, this silent trunk was now gruesomely called upon to exemplify it. I can still see Herbert West under the sinister electric light as he injected his reanimating solution into the arm of the headless body. The scene I cannot describe. I would faint if I tried it. For there is a madness in a room full of classified charnel things, with blood and lesser human debris almost ankle-deep on the slimy floor, and with hideous reptilian abnormalities sprouting, bubbling, and baking over a winking bluish-green specter of dim flame in a far corner of black shadows. The specimen, as West repeatedly observed, had a splendid nervous system. Much was expected of it, and as a few twitching motions began to appear, I could see the feverish interest on West's face. He was ready, I think, to see proof of his increasingly strong opinion that consciousness, reason, and personality can exist independently of the brain, that man has no central, connective spirit, but is merely a machine of nervous matter, each section more or less complete in itself. In one triumphant demonstration, West was about to relegate the mystery of life to the category of myth. The body now twitched more vigorously, and beneath our avid eyes commenced to heave in a frightful way. The arms stirred disquietingly, the legs drew up, and various muscles contracted in a repulsive kind of writhing. Then the headless thing threw its arms out in a gesture which was unmistakably one of desperation, an intelligent desperation, apparently sufficient to prove every theory of Herbert West. Certainly the nerves were recalling the man's last act in life, the struggle to get free of the falling airplane. What followed, I shall never positively know. It may have been wholly a hallucination from the shock caused at that instant by the sudden and complete destruction of the building in a cataclysm of German shell fire. Who can gainsay it, since West and I were the only proved survivors? West liked to think that before his recent disappearance. But there were times when he could not, for it was queer that we both had the same hallucination. The hideous occurrence itself was very simple, notable only for what it implied. The body on the table had risen with a blind and terrible groping, and we had heard a sound. I should not call that sound a voice, for it was too awful, and yet its timber was not the most awful thing about it. Neither was its message. It had merely screamed, Jump, Ronald! For God's sake, jump! The awful thing was its source. For it had come from the large covered vat in that ghoulish corner of crawling black shadows. Part 6. The Tomb Legion When Dr. Herbert West disappeared a year ago, the Boston police questioned me closely. They suspected that I was holding something back, and perhaps suspected graver things. But I could not tell them the truth, because they would not have believed it. They knew indeed that West had been connected with activities beyond the credence of ordinary men, for his hideous experiments in the reanimation of dead bodies had long been too extensive to admit of perfect secrecy. But the final, soul-shattering catastrophe held elements of demonic fantasy, which make even me doubt the reality of what I saw. I was West's closest friend and only confidential assistant. We had met years before in medical school, 
and from the first I had shared his terrible researches. He had slowly tried to perfect the solution which, injected into the veins of the newly deceased, would restore life, a labor demanding an abundance of fresh corpses, and therefore involving the most unnatural action. Still more shocking were the products of some of his experiments, grisly masses of flesh that had been dead, but that West waked to a blind, brainless, nauseous animation. These were the usual results, for in order to reawaken the mind, it was necessary to have specimens so absolutely fresh that no decay could possibly affect the delicate brain cells. This need for very fresh corpses had been West's moral undoing. They were hard to get, and one awful day he had secured a specimen while it was still alive and vigorous. A struggle, a needle, and a powerful alkaloid had transformed it into a very fresh corpse. And the experiment had succeeded for a brief and memorable moment. But West had emerged with a soul callous and seared, a hardened eye, which sometimes glanced with a kind of hideous and calculating appraisal at men of a specially sensitive brain and a specially vigorous physique. Toward the last, I became acutely afraid of West, for he began to look at me that way. People did not seem to notice his glances, but they noticed my fear, and after his disappearance, used that as a basis for some absurd suspicions. West, in reality, was more afraid than I, for his abominable pursuits entailed a life of furtiveness and dread of every shadow. Harshly, it was the police he feared, but sometimes his nervousness was deeper and more nebulous, touching on certain indescribable things into which he had in injected a morbid life, and from which he had not seen that life depart. He usually finished his experiments with a revolver, but a few times he had not been quick enough. There was that first specimen on whose rifled grave marks of clawing were later seen. There was also that our camp professor's body, which had done cannibal things before it had been captured and thrust unidentified into a madhouse cell at Sefton, where it beat the walls for sixteen years. Most of the other possibly surviving results were things less easy to speak of, for in later years, West's scientific zeal had degenerated into an unhealthy and fantastic mania. He had spent his chief skill in vitalizing not entire human bodies, but isolated parts of bodies, or parts joined to organic matter other than human. It had become fiendishly disgusting by the time he disappeared. Many of the experiments could not even be hinted at in print. The Great War, through which both of us served as surgeons, had intensified this side of West. In saying that West's fear of his specimens was nebulous, I have in mind particularly its complex nature. Part of it came merely from knowing of the existence of such nameless monsters, while another part rose from apprehension of the bodily harm they might under certain circumstances do him. Their disappearance added horror to the situation. Of them all, West knew the whereabouts of only one, the pitiful asylum thing. Then there was a more subtle fear, a very fantastic sensation resulting from a curious experiment in the Canadian Army in 1915. West, in the midst of a severe battle, had reanimated Major Sir Eric Moreland Clapham Lee, DSO, a fellow physician who knew about the, his experiments and could have duplicated them. The head had been removed so that the possibilities of quasi-intelligent life in the trunk might be investigated. Just as the building was wiped out by a German shell, there had been a success. The trunk had moved intelligently, and, unbelievable to relate, we were both sickeningly sure that articulate sounds had come from the detached head as it lay in a shadowy corner of the laboratory. The shell had been merciful in a way, but West could never feel as certain as he wished that we, too, were the only survivors. He used to make shuddering conjectures about the possible actions of a headless physician with the power of reanimating the dead. West's last quarters were in a venerable house of much elegance, overlooking one of the oldest burying grounds in Boston. He had chosen the place 
for purely symbolic and fantastical aesthetic reasons, since most of the internments were of the colonial period, and therefore of little use to a scientist seeking very fresh bodies. The laboratory was in a sub-cellar secretly constructed by imported workmen and containing a huge incinerator for the quiet and complete disposal of such bodies or fragments and synthetic mockeries of bodies as might remain from the morbid experiments and unhallowed amusements of the owner. During the excavation of this cellar, the workmen had struck some exceedingly ancient masonry, undoubtedly connected with the old burying ground, yet far too deep to correspond with any known sepulchre therein. After a number of calculations, West decided that it represented some secret chamber beneath the tomb of the Averils, where the last interment had been made in 1768. I was with him when he studied the nitrous dripping walls laid bare by the spades and mattocks of the men, and was prepared for the gruesome thrill which would attend the uncovering of centuried grave secrets. But for the first time, West's new timidity conquered his natural curiosity, and he betrayed his degenerating fiber by ordering the masonry left intact and plastered over. Thus, it remained until the final hellish night, part of the walls of the secret laboratory. I speak of West's decadence, but must add that it was a purely mental and intangible thing. Outwardly, he was the same to the last, calm, cold, slight, yellow-haired, with spectacled blue eyes, and a general aspect of youth, which years and fears seemed never to change. He seemed calm, even when he thought of that clawed grave and looked over his shoulder, even when he thought of the carnivorous thing that gnawed and pawed at Sefton bars. The end of Herbert West began one evening in our joint study, when he was dividing his curious glance between the newspaper and me. A strange headline item had struck at him from the crumpled page, and a nameless titan claw had seemed to reach down through sixteen years. Something fearsome and incredible had happened at Sefton Asylum, fifty miles away, stunning the neighborhood and baffling the police. In the small hours of the morning, a body of silent men had entered the grounds, and their leader had aroused the attendants. He was a menacing military figure who talked without moving his lips, and whose voice seemed almost ventriloquially connected with an immense black case he carried. The expressionless face was handsome to the point of radiant beauty, and had shocked the superintendent when the hall light fell on it, for it was a wax face with eyes of painted glass. Some nameless accident had befallen this man. A larger man guided his steps, a repellent hulk whose bluish face seemed half eaten away by some unknown malady. The speaker had asked for the custody of the cannibal monster committed from Arkham sixteen years before, and upon being refused, gave a signal which precipitated a shocking riot. The fiends had beaten, trampled, and bitten every attendant who did not flee, killing four and finally succeeding in the liberation of the monster. Those victims, who could recall the event without hysteria, swore that the creatures had acted less like men than like unthinkable automata, guided by the wax-faced leader. By the time help could be summoned, every trace of the men and their mad charge had vanished. From the hour of reading this item until midnight, West sat almost paralyzed. At midnight, the doorbell rang, startling him fearfully. All the servants were asleep in the attic, so I answered the bell. As I have told the police, there was no wagon in the street, but only a group of strange-looking figures bearing a large square box, which they deposited in the hallway after one of them had grunted, in a highly unnatural voice, Express. Prepaid. They filed out of the house with a jerky tread, and as I watched them go, I had an odd idea that they were turning toward the ancient cemetery, on which the back of the house abutted. When I slammed the door after them, West came downstairs and looked at the box. It was about two feet square, and bore West's correct name and present address. It also bore the inscription, From Eric Moreland, Clapham Lee, St. Aloy, Flanders. Six years before, in Flanders, 
The shelled hospital had fallen upon the headless reanimated trunk of Dr. Clapham Lee, and upon the detached head, which, perhaps, had uttered articulate sounds. West was not even excited now. His condition was more ghastly. Quickly, he said, It's the finish, but let's incinerate this. We carried the thing down to the laboratory, listening. I do not remember many particulars. You can imagine my state of mind. But it is a vicious lie to say that it was Herbert West's body which I put into the incinerator. We both inserted the whole unopened wooden box, closed the door, and started the electricity. Nor did any sound come from the box after all. It was West who first noticed the falling plaster on that part of the wall where the ancient tomb masonry had been covered up. I was going to run, but he stopped me. Then I saw a small black aperture, felt a ghoulish wind of ice, and smelled the carnal bowels of a putrescent earth. There was no sound, but just then the electric lights went out, and I saw, outlined against some phosphorescence of the netherworld, a horde of silent, toiling things, which only an insanity, or worse, could create. Their outlines were human, semi-human, fractionally human, and not human at all. The horde was grotesquely heterogeneous. They were removing the stones quietly, one by one, from the centuried wall, and then, as the breach became large enough, they came out into the laboratory single file, led by a talking thing with a beautiful head made of wax. A sort of mad-eyed monstrosity behind the leader seized on Herbert West. West did not resist or utter a sound. Then they all sprang at him and tore him to pieces before my eyes, bearing the fragments away into that subterranean vault of fabulous abominations. West's head was carried off by the wax-headed leader, who wore a Canadian officer's uniform. As it disappeared, I saw that the blue eyes behind the spectacle were hideously blazing with their first touch of frantic, visible emotion. Servants found me unconscious in the morning. West was gone. The incinerator contained only unidentifiable ashes. Detectives have questioned me, but what can I say? The Sefton tragedy, they will not connect with West. Not that, nor the men with the box, whose existence they deny. I told them of the vault and they pointed to the unbroken plaster wall and laughed, so I told them no more. They imply that I am either a madman or a murderer. Probably I am mad, but I might not be mad if those accursed tomb legions had not been so silent. End of Herbert West, Reanimator Recording by Matt Bonehoff Thank you for listening to The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Join us next time when we have a full episode. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and at pgtcm.com and pgttcm.podbean.com. People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Check out darkmyths.org to find out more about them and some really cool podcasts. This episode has been edited by D.B. Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod. You've been listening to The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, pgttcm.com. <laughs> stay squiggly, keep it weird, or stay weird and keep it squiggly. Whichever you want to do, you do it. <laughs>